Films in Focus with David Sterrett is underwritten by The Movie House, your destination for first-run Hollywood and independent movies, and a digital portal to the Met Opera, National Theater Live, and special events worldwide in Millerton, New York, and on the web, themoviehouse.net. David Sterrett is the editor-in-chief of the Quarterly Review of Film and Video, contributing writer at Cineast, film professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art, Robin Hood Radio's very own critic. He joins us weekly. The films White Noise, She Said, and The Eternal Daughter. And I have made a haiku, and I am going to say it. White Noise, She Said, The Eternal Daughter. Hi, David. How are you? I was not going to let that go. (laughs) <laughs> I am fine, Joe. How are you doing this week? I'm not haiku. <laughs> I can see that you're uh, in in extremely poetic form uh, this week, so so that's good. I'm not sure how well these movies vary in their degrees of poetry, but um, they're literary. A couple of them are literary in their way. Anyway, let's begin with White Noise. This is a movie which is based on a very, very fine novel, which I have read more than once, by Don DeLillo. And uh, it is a movie by Noah Baumbach. Now, Noah Baumbach is still a comparatively young filmmaker. He's made a few movies, and I must say he has rather of a cult built around him already. Uh, There are a lot of people who feel he is one of the great geniuses of the younger filmmakers of today. I disagree with that. I think he's a perfectly talented movie maker, but I am not a member of his cult of rabid admirers. This movie also stars a couple of people who have sort of developed cults around themselves, Adam Driver and Greta Gerwig. Adam Driver, I think, is a really interesting actor, although I think he's been overexposed in the last few years, been in far too many movies, Uh, but he's good. Greta Gerwig is regarded by some people as one of the most captivating movie stars in history, and I do not share that opinion. I just have never really gotten the point. She's fine, but she is not any sort of a great genius of acting. That said, this movie certainly has some very interesting people who have put it together. Uh, Noah Baumbach, the director, who also, by the way, wrote the screenplay based on Don DeLillo's book and the stars um, Adam Driver and Greta Gerwig. So what is it about? Uh, It is about a college. It takes place largely at or near a college, and it is about a household. Uh, The main character is a guy named Jack, played by Adam Driver, and he is a college professor. And uh, the the novel by uh, Don DeLillo, like the movie, uh, it has a lot of satirical intent. So uh, Jack, who is really the main character of both the book and the film, uh, is the founder of the Department of Hitler Studies uh, at the college where he teaches a place called the College on the Hill. And among other things, he is struggling throughout the story to learn German. Uh, He's kind of embarrassed that he has founded a department of Hitler studies and has never learned German. Uh, But he also is coping with his household, his wife, uh, Babette, who is played by Greta Gerwig in the movie. And one of the mysteries of the film and one of the little elements of the plot is that she is taking some sort of pill or medication or something which she is keeping a secret from her husband Uh, But their daughter figures out that this is going on. And so one of the things that's going on in the movie is that Jack is trying to find out what this stuff is that Babette is taking and why she is taking it. And this leads to some high melodrama in the later part of the movie. And then along the way, he is dealing with his college, dealing with his students, dealing with his colleagues, one of whom, uh, who is played uh, marvelously by Don Cheadle, uh, is a great professor of consumerism who wants to do with Elvis Presley what Adam Driver has done for for or Jack has done for Adolf Hitler. So this is what the the movie is 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 all about. Uh, it is in the large uh, to large extent satirical. Again, with Jack and his department of Hitler studies and his and his colleague who is dealing with Elvis Presley studies and this kind of thing. Uh, and it is also uh, dealing with uh, with with the family and the children and the comings and goings and all of that. Now, what sparks the plot is that a an environmental disaster happens not far away from the college and not far away from the home where Jack and his family live. 
uh, and it causes a, a, a huge plume of toxic material to go into the air, which becomes known as the airborne toxic event, and the family has to uh, evacuate their home and a lot of other families are evacuating their home and there's all kinds of chaos going on around this. So uh, white noise has really quite a few little strands going through the plot, although they're very well integrated with each other. Uh, we have the dealings at the college, we have the dealings with the family, and then we have perhaps above all the evacuation, the chaos that ensues uh, from the, uh, the airborne toxic event. And then eventually we have the dramatic events that ensue when Jack attempts to find out where Babette is getting these pills and what they are and why she is taking them. Now, all of this hangs together beautifully in the novel, which, as I've already said, is a brilliant novel, in my opinion. It hangs together not quite so beautifully in the movie, although I found the movie always entertaining to watch. I think in a lot of ways it's the best movie that Noah Baumbach has yet made. The end of it, unfortunately, in the novel is a re marvelous, resonant, almost poetic kind of ending. And in the movie, I found it kind of washed out. It doesn't really amount to much. So the, the, the finale of the film, I would have to say, is quite disappointing. But the movie is entertaining to watch. If you enjoy seeing Adam Driver, if you enjoy seeing Greta Gerwig, they're very good in this film, although Greta Gerwig still underwhelms me. And the whole movie, I think, has a lot of interesting satire in it, and a little bit of a fairly effective drama. So it's a good movie, one of the year's better movies, not one of the year's best movies. Uh, recommended, but not the highest recommendation by any means. The next movie, Jill, uh, that I want to talk about this week is also based on a book. Uh, it is the movie She Said, which is based on a nonfiction book uh, by two New York Times reporters, Jody Cantor and Megan Toohey. And it is a movie about very dramatic real life stuff that is still very much resonating in our world. Uh, it is about the, 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 the case of Harvey Weinstein and the, uh, well, at first were allegations and then were proved in court to have been fact uh, of his is uh, sexual harassment, sexual abuse, uh, sexual assaults uh, on various women. And uh, what we have is these two New York Times reporters uh, who uh, get onto this story and determine to find out whether it is true or not. And of course, they ultimately discover that it is true. So this is very much a newspaper drama about the heroic efforts of these two reporters to pursue this story. And uh, along, by the way, with their editor, Rebecca Corbett, who is played by Patricia Clarkson, and another editor, Dean Baquet, played by Andre Brower, all of these real life people to get the goods on this Harvey Weinstein story. Now, I have to say I used to know Harvey Weinstein. Back in my New York days, I dealt with him from time to time when I was working with the New York Film Festival and other times. I dealt with him and his company, Miramax Films. And of course, I never saw any of this awful stuff going on, but the awful stuff was really going on. And Harvey Weinstein right now is serving a very long prison sentence for this and is on trial again on the West Coast, where he may get a whole bunch of new prison sentences if he is found guilty there. So all of this very much worked out for the reporters who got this story. And of course, one of the little subplots of the story is that they discover while they are working on getting the goods on Harvey Weinstein, that the New Yorker is also working on the same story. Uh, Ronan Farrow is dealing with that. And he also wrote a book about this ultimately, which I've also read. I've read all these books. So uh, this is quite fascinating stuff and, and material that I was very interested to get into for all kinds of reasons, because I've read the books because it's a fascinating story, because I used to know Harvey Weinstein and stuff like this. So, so, how is the movie, she said? Uh, it is very noble in its purposes, and it also just never quite develops any real dramatic momentum. Now, of course, the material is real, the material is important, and on that level, it's a really, it's a, it's a major film. And anybody who is not familiar with all this stuff should really see the movie and get familiar with it, because the movie gives you a pretty good account of the horrible stuff that went on, and the horrible effects that it's had on the careers of all sorts of young women uh, getting into the movie business, entering the movie business, starting to move it up in the movie business, and the terrible things that happen to them on account of Harvey Weinstein's predations upon them, and then the revenge he took when they didn't reciprocate his efforts and that sort of thing. So all of that is really, really important. But the movie, directed by Maria Schrader, just never develops any real dramatic momentum. It's this point, and then this point, and then this point, and it goes on and on, and it's interesting, but it's also at the same time kind of dull. The acting, I have to say, is really good, especially by the two main 
main actors. Uh, Carrie Mulligan, who plays Megan Toohey, and Zoe Kazan, who plays Jodie Cantor. They, especially, I think, Zoe Kazan, are just really, really solid. Good performances. You get involved with these two characters. You care about them. But again, the movie, mainly the way it's scripted, unfortunately, uh, the screenplay is by Rebecca Linkowitz, although based on, on of course, the book by Cantor and Toohey. Uh, the script just never really, it never really gets very dramatic. I keep saying that, but that's really the best way to put it. So again, important stuff in itself, inherently tremendously dramatic stuff, but the movie just kind of sits there. By all means, see it if you're not familiar with this story, because it's an important real story that happened just recently in the real world. But as a movie, as a drama, as a piece of fascinating material, it just never quite comes together. I wish I could say differently, but I'm afraid I can't. Our third movie today, by the way, uh, like uh, she said, it was also directed by a woman, in this case, Joanna Hogue, who is uh, a filmmaker who also, I'm going to say this again, has a kind of a cult around her. There are people who feel she is one of the great filmmakers in the world. I have never felt that. I've seen her movies. They're kind of interesting. Her last one, which was called The Souvenir Part Two, I thought was really pretty interesting. But she has not yet made a great film. But she comes the closest that she's come yet, I think, in The Eternal Daughter. So it's a movie I really want to praise. It's a very, very interesting movie. Also, it has going for it Tilda Swinton, who I think is one of the great, great, great actors of our time. She is phenomenal. And in this movie, The Eternal Daughter, we get two Tilda Swintons for the price of one because she plays two different characters. She plays a young woman. Well, actually, not such a young woman, a middle-aged woman uh, whose name is Julie. And she plays Julie's mother. And the movie begins with Julie and her mother, both played by Tilda Swinton, arriving at a hotel where they're going to be staying for a while. And over the course of the film, we discover, we realize that this hotel used to be their family home. It's where their family resided for many, many years. And then changes came upon the family and they lost possession of the home and the home was turned into a hotel where they go now to stay for a while. And it's a mysterious hotel. Uh, it seems to be a nice enough place. The receptionist who greets them and checks them in is sort of, uh, sort of officious with them, not very friendly, not very nice, just getting the job done. Uh, and yeah, they can't even have the room that they really originally booked that they really want because somebody else has that room, but they realize as time passes during their early stay in this hotel, there don't appear to be any other people around. There's the person who waits on them in the dining room, but there's no other patrons in the dining room. They never seem to see other people in the hallway except for a couple of people who work in the hotel. So it's sort of mysterious. There's something strange going on here. Something else is strange going on in the way the movie is structured, the way it's made. The mother and the daughter are both major characters in this film, and we see a lot of them, and we hear a lot of them. We see their interactions. We see them get settled into the hotel. They have a dog with them, the mother's dog. And Julie goes and walks the dog from time to time. But we never see the mother and the daughter in the same shot throughout the entire film. We're always cutting between mother, daughter, mother, daughter, mother, daughter. Interesting. A couple of times, I think twice over the course of the movie, we do see them in the same shot. But almost always they are separated. They're in their separate beds and we see the cutting back and forth. They're on opposite sides of the table in the dining room and we see them in separate shots cutting back and forth and then of course we see them separately from time to time especially Julie walking the dog or going outside to make a phone call to her husband who has not come along on this trip and that sort of thing so it's a mysterious film it's mysterious in its subject matter why are there no other people staying at this hotel why are we told there are other people staying at this hotel what is the actual history of this hotel and the family of Julie and her mother and then again the way the film is shot always seeing these two people separately, never quite seeing them together, except every once in a great while. Well, of course, we slowly realize as the movie unfolds that in some sort of mysterious way, this is some sort of a ghost story. In fact, uh, Julie herself is a filmmaker, like the making of, maker of this film, Joanna Hogue, and she is working on a movie that she wants to get made. She's trying to write it right now, and it apparently is a kind of a ghost story. We see her reading ghost stories from time to time. So there's a lot of clues that the movie we are watching is a ghost story. And ultimately, it seems that the way to piece together the mysteries of this movie, the mysteries of the content of the movie, the mysteries of the characters of the movie, the mysteries of the way the movie is shot and structured, uh, 
do have something to do with some kind of ghostly doings in one way or another. Are both Julie and her mother actually there? And of course, since the mother is the older one and the one we center on a little bit less than on Julie herself, we start to wonder if the mother, in fact, is really there at all or whether maybe Julie is imagining her, remembering her, hallucinating her, exactly what the story is. And I won't tell you how the whole movie turns out. The Eternal Daughter is not a thriller. It is surely not a horror movie, but it is a kind of a ghostly movie, a kind of a phantasmagorical movie in a very quiet way. I found it just fascinating. It's full of mood. It's full of atmosphere. This hotel is kind of a ghostly place. The outdoors is kind of ghostly. Mysterious things happen there, but they're not overwhelmingly mysterious. They're gently, quietly mysterious. It's a movie to sink into, not to thrill to. I totally recommend The Eternal Daughter. I don't think Joanna Hogue is a great filmmaker yet, although some people feel she is. Uh, but I do feel that she is maybe on her way to becoming a great filmmaker, and The Eternal Daughter is the best movie she has made so far. I totally recommend it, and it's great counter-programming to all the action stuff that is out there these days as well. So The Eternal Daughter of my three movies this week, Jill, is the one that I think people ought to go and see. And by the way, it's streaming, it's easy to see, catch up with it. It's a good picture. So that is my somewhat based on books this week story, Jill. Not to mention an enthusiastic recommendation. And we always measure your enthusiasm in a very special and secret okay. equation. Thank you very much, David Sterrett. Films in Focus, the films White Noise, She Said, and The Eternal Daughter. <laughs>